moments. Uh, just before we get started, I just wanted to draw your attention or, or welcome you to the Zoom platform. If uh, at any point in time you encounter any challenges with Zoom, please feel free to reach out to me. You can get a hold of me via the chat window at the bottom of your screen. And also you'll note that there's both a chat and a Q&A uh, button at the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to use the Q&A to communicate with our presenter in order to ask questions. And if you have any comments um, for the general audience or questions of tech to support nature, feel free to communicate with us using the chat. So without further delay, we'll go ahead and pass things off to uh, Robin. Go ahead, Robin. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another year of C2C Care. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors. And I pay my respect to elders, both past and present. Um, well, again, welcome. This is the new year. We're excited to have this presentation today. Um, I'm going to run through just a couple quick intro slides and we're going to hand off the presentation to our speaker today. As we said, today's presentation is all going to be about care of baskets and basketry. Again, my name is Robin Bauer-Kilgo. I'm the C2C Care Coordinator, and you just met Mike, who is our producer over at Learning Times. Really quick, um, I think most people of this group especially know about this, but I always like to plug our website, connectingtocollections.org. Uh, there you can find an entire fabulous archives, resources, and everything else related to our program, which is supported by IMLS and FAIC. Um, again, our archives for both our courses and our webinars, there is a plethora of information on this website. It is all free. Anyone can access it. We have recordings of webinars and all sorts of fun things. So um, if you want to go on there, use the search button, type in the subject that maybe you're interested in, and there's most likely a webinar on it. We also have an online community, um, which is available for anyone to post questions when it comes to care questions. Um, what's nice about our community is that it is moderated by conservation professionals or conservators. So if you have a question related to the care of any objects in your collections, post a question. Um, one of our mo fabulous volunteer monitors will take a look at it and get you some great information on how to deal with it. So I do encourage everyone to go check out that online area. We also have two homes online over on facebook.com and our Twitter account where we do announcements for our upcoming webinars and anything else you might be interested in. A couple of quick future programming notes before we get into today's uh, topics. On February 16th, we will have a free webinar called the Labeling Lightning Round. Um, we are working on putting it together now. But basically, it's going to be a chance for you to learn uh, methodologies on how to put numbers on your collection items from presenters from all around the world. Actually, we're going to have a combination of recorded videos and live Q&A. So we're looking forward to it. It'll be February 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We also have a course starting in March. The course um, is going to be a five webinar series. The courses do have a small fee attached to them, but um, the, it'll be some great information. It's all about planning and managing magnetic media preservation projects. So essentially, if you look into your collection storage area and you see a lot of VHS tapes and other items kept on magnetic media, this course will help you organize it, get an inventory of it, be able to actually start looking at preservation long-term projects to get the data over to more stable formats, all sorts of fun things. So I would encourage you to take a look at our website. Um, both of those items are gonna be on there by the end of the week and you will be able to start registering for them at that time. As Mike said, there are two boxes. I think most of us are pretty used to Zoom by now, but I always like to point out there are two separate boxes when it comes to chat and Q&A. If you want to speak to the panelists on just a comment or you're having a technical issue, use the chat. If you have a question during the Q&A period, which will happen after the presentation, please put it in the Q&A box. It just helps us track the questions a little bit easier. And now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, her name is Maury Tutloff. She is an objects conservator at the Museum of Anthropology, UBC in Vancouver, Canada. We're really excited to have her speak today. So I'm going to go ahead and give control of the presentation open to her. And we will see you all at the end during the Q&A period. See you soon. Hi, Robin. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, sorry, can you see my screen? 
Not yet. So go ahead and try to share it real quick and we'll okay. see if you can pop it up. How's that? Whoops, perfect. Go okay. for it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. I'm Marae Tutloff. I'm a conservator at the Museum of Anthropology uh, at the University of British Columbia. And uh, today um, I'm going to be talking about the care of basketry in museum collections. So, um, sorry. Um, first of all, um, I would like to say that I am speaking to you from the Museum of Anthropology which is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, I did want to give a brief introduction to the Museum of Anthropology and the work that we do here um, to uh, frame how we care for our collections and in particular baskets. So one of the things about uh, the museum, one of the first places that you walk into at the Museum of Anthropology, which I will probably refer to from now on as MOA, is uh, the Great Hall. So in this area at, uh, at the entrance of the museum, uh, we have all of our monumental totem poles and house posts, and uh, the architecture of the building is meant to mimic uh, the post and beam architecture of the Northwest Coast. Uh, from there, uh, you can visit our multi-versity galleries, which I will likely refer to as the MVG. Um, our multi-versity galleries are uh, 14,000 square foot space, um, and we exhibit about 10,000 objects from all over the world. And the concept is uh, visible storage, which allows us to um, exhibit or have a lot more objects on exhibit uh, than, than usual. So um, here um, on the left of the screen is our Kwakwaki Walk platform. And you can see all those beautiful dance masks. And um, on the right is our Cantonese opera case. So we do have a very large Asian collection um, and uh, in particular Cantonese opera. Uh, we also have about 3,000 baskets in our collection. So this part of the MVG um, on the left is showing all of our Northwest Coast baskets um, on exhibit. Um, and on the right, um, this is showing a Javanese wicker motorcycle, which although not um, a typical basket, it's definitely made of from basketry materials. Um, and we also, you can see some Indonesian uh, wicker hats also in the same image. So uh, we do have the traditional baskets, but we also have a lot of uh, contemporary pieces that are made from uh, traditional materials using traditional methods. So on the very left, we have this, uh, this woven cedar bark panel, which is so new, we don't even have a, a proper photo of it, but I wanted to show you just so you could see how those traditional methods are used in contemporary uh, pieces. And um, you may have similar things in your museums under your care. Uh, in the middle slide is a, a cedar bark and wool dance tunic. Um, and then on the right is a contemporary New, New Hulk mask with a cedar bark fringe. So we definitely, we have a lot of cedar bark in our collection. Another uh, thing that's important to know about the Museum of Anthropology is we are one of the largest teaching museums in Canada. So we do teach courses in conservation. And here you see my colleague Heidi Swearinga introducing uh, the students of the care or the conservation of organic objects. She's introducing them to Japanese tissue which uh, they're gonna be using in a subsequent lab on the repair of basketry. And then we also have a number of interns in conservation. We usually host one or two a year. Um, and you can see here, this was our intern in 2019, Sally Kim, who's working on a Cantonese opera headdress. Some of the other important work that we do at the Museum of Anthropology involves collection access. 
So being uh, affiliated uh, with the university, we do have a lot of researchers and classes and artists that want to come and get up close to our collection. So we definitely have a program where people can, um, we will pull objects and uh, people can come in and get a closer look at them. But we also have um, a, a special program uh, for collections access for family and community members, originating community members. So here we have um, on the left, this woman who is, who's come to visit her familial objects. So her father uh, was a carver and he carved all the objects on the table that she, she wanted to see. And she's also wearing her mother's dance robe which is part of our collection. So uh, when we do have uh, families coming to visit their objects, we do not impose any um, sorts of handling restrictions on them. They are allowed to touch things with their bare hands if they wish. Um, if for some reason um, we feel that there is a danger um, because of pesticide residues or um, something inherently um, toxic in the object, we will mention it to them, but we don't uh, restrict any access to family or community members. Uh, something else, we also have an outreach program where we will actually, uh, people can have, or communities can request to have their objects come to their community because it's not always easy for people to come to the museum. So we have a funding program to uh, either bring people into the museum to see their objects, or we can uh, take museums out to the community so people can visit their objects in person. And um, the um, knowledge that's gained from these types of interactions is really invaluable. Um, we can learn so much about um, parts of the collection from people who actually know these, these objects who, who have, you know, maybe a relatives ha have made them. Um, but also there's just a lot of joy that uh, comes when people can see their community objects up close and personal. So we do take this as an important part of the pres preservation process. And uh, we refer to it as preserving the intangible aspects of the object. Another thing uh, that we do at the museum is we share, well, we share a um, building space with the UBC Laboratory of Archaeology, um, LOA. And uh, LOA acts as a repository for a lot of wet site materials in the province. So uh, these are materials that come out of the ground that uh, maybe can't be treated right away. Um, LOA will hold on to them. We act as an overflow um, for in our cold storage for keeping those objects safe. But we do also have um, the equipment to treat these objects, uh, cleaning or um, preservation treatments, which I will probably talk about a little bit later. So um, that was just the background and I hope that gives some context to why we care for the things that we do the way we do. Um, so when we, we think about caring for basketry, uh, there's three things that we consider uh, first and foremost. First, uh, the materials. What's the basket made of? The materials are definitely going to affect how your um, basket is going to interact with the environment. That's, that's really um, an important first step. Second is the construction. So by looking at the construction of the basket, you should be able to uh, pinpoint areas of weakness or strength. So um, looking at the con construction is important. Uh, and then the history of use. So the history of use also can um, lead you to conclusions about uh, weaknesses or um, what areas may need support, but also um, uh, it can also give you clues um, to things like dirt um, that are on your basket. So is it, was it dirt that was um, gained through use? And if so, that's something that's very important and that, that you want to retain that information. Um, so anyway, yes, you would look at, uh, say, a berry basket differently than a Northwest Coast hat. And I should point out that these um, baskets here that you see in this photo, this is part of our teaching collection. So these are the baskets that we let our students um, practice their 
um, repairs and documentations on. Uh, so further on materials, um, as conservators, we look at, you know, just sort of broad definitions of the organic and the inorganic materials. Basketry materials are usually organic, so usually plant materials, uh, things like roots, bark, stems, leaves, and grasses. Uh, there, there may well be animal materials on baskets. That's, that's definitely something that we see. So things like quills or feather, skin, baleen, um, even hair. Um, so oftentimes they are decorative elements. And then lastly, resins and plastics. So uh, oh. resins, I'm thinking about some Southwest baskets that have uh, pine pitch as a waterproofing agent. Um, but there's also contemporary baskets made of resins and of course made of plastics. Um, even though they're, they may be synthetic, they behave more like organic materials. So we do consider them organic. And that's versus the inorganic materials, things like metal, ceramics, glass, stone. Uh, those can be found definitely on baskets. Uh, metals, I'm thinking with enclosures, um, glass, if there's any beads, um, things like that. Um, so if we are thinking about traditional, traditionally made baskets, uh, we should consider how the basket is made, the basketry construction. And it is important to remember that uh, those natural materials um, are harvested at some point. Um, here, I'm, I, I can't go through all the harvesting methods, but this is just an example. This is uh, harvesting cedar bark. Um, so usually you make a small slit at the base of the tree and then you pull these long strips off the tree and then take off the outer bark and you're left with the, the smooth inner cedar bark. Um, and usually um, there are some traditions that go along with these practices. Um, I know for cedar bark, there's only um, one strip per tree taken because the tree doesn't regrow, regrow that um, bark. Um, also for cedar bark, there's usually a curing time, uh, could be up to a year. Uh, and then there is um, some sort of processing. So for cedar bark, um, usually after the curing time, uh, the cedar bark soaked. Some of uh, the soaking process can remove the natural products and just make the bark more pliable and more suitable for weaving. So in terms of construction techniques, um, there are three main ones um, and there's all sorts of variations, but these are the three uh, main techniques that we see in Northwest Coast basketry, but they're also techniques um, that are used all over the world for making baskets. So the first one is plating, um, which you see here. So it's a checker weave and the weft crosses over and under one warp at a time and you get that nice checkerboard look. The next is coiling. So here in coiling, you have this um, found it, whoops. I went, went ahead too early. Anyways, uh, here you have the foundation material, which is usually quite strong uh, and it's wrapped with a more supple material and then the coils are sewn together, either with sinew or another type of root um, or woven together. Uh, those baskets made with coiling are considered very strong um, and can even hold water and on the coast sometimes used for cooking. And then lastly, we have the twining. Um, and this is where two wefts cross over each other, two or more wefts cross over each other between each warp. And here is, uh, you can see an example of this type of weaving uh, for this really finely woven new Chalneth basket. Um, and I'd like to point out um, the colored elements. So those are usually um, natural dyed or aniline dyed um, grasses or roots that are incorporated into the weaving. So further on the decorative elements, um, I think it's, it's good to um, talk about them because often uh, they can be the areas that do um, uh, are start falling apart uh, faster. 
than the rest of the basket. And I, I can go into why, but um, here we have a little birch bark basket and I didn't talk about the construction of birch bark baskets. I mean, we definitely have a lot of them and I'm sure that um, you also have um, birch bark baskets in your collection. And those are just made by sewing uh, the sheets of the harvested bark together. Um, but um, often these baskets are decorated with quill work or sometimes incising. Um, and then the basket on the left is a, a little Brazilian basket decorated with uh, dyed horsehair. Um, also, uh, we see a lot of um, imbrication on our basket as a design choice. So imbrication um, involves taking another uh, strip of different colored material and you're weaving it back and forth uh, in the wefts and um, folding it back on itself. And a variation of this is called beading where you're just going um, over and under the weft of, of the basket and you can get this, um, this kind of checkerboard um, appearance. So uh, one thing about the colored elements of uh, these baskets, um, usually the red color is uh, cherry bark, um, but often the darker colored strips are made um, by soaking the material in an iron rich uh, solution. So either um, iron uh, rich from iron from the soil, sometimes um, soaking things like iron nails or uh, metals, and uh, you get that really dark uh, black, brown, or even green color. Uh, so the iron uh, acts as a mordant for any dyes that are used, but unfortunately it also acts, um, it, it does speed up the deterioration process. And we do find that a lot of this imbrication is very fragile. So uh, let's talk about damage um, and how damage can happen in your collection. Uh, usually um, there are, Sort of several things happening at once. There's um, there's not just one cause for damage. Um, it's usually sort of a process or an accumulation. So because I'm in Canada, um, I'm using the CCI or the Canadian Conservation Institute model for talking about deterioration. And so um, CCI, I think this is a pretty um, general way of looking at it though, uh, CCI has defined 10 agents of deterioration, uh, physical forces, fire, pests, light, incorrect relative humidity, thieves and vandals, water, pollutants, incorrect temperature and disassociation. So I'm, I'm not going to go into depth into all of those, but I really wanna pick out the important ones and talk about how we, um, how we handle those at our museum. So um, first, uh, let's talk about physical deterioration. So that, I mean, with everything, right? It can be a gradual process that happens over time. With organic materials, um, definitely they will, um, you know, take up water and release water or humidity in their environment. And there's sort of a constant uh, swelling and shrinking, swelling and shrinking. And after a while, it just gets harder to uh, organic materials to retain that moisture. So a lot of, I hear from a lot of people who have um, very dry, brittle baskets and are looking for a solution. What should I do? Um, and uh, one thing that we have seen are, um, people have been recommended to apply some sort of uh, dressing or um, on their baskets or washing their baskets. And these in the long run uh, prove to be very, very detrimental. So um, these two images on the bottom, uh, we have a group of baskets or from a group of baskets in our collection. So at one point, uh, the collector wanting to revive the look of their basket had washed it in ivory soap and then had applied some sort of dressing, some sort of, I don't know exactly what it was, but it's quite oily. So now um, we have the basket in our collection. I mean, you can see that it's a bit darkened or it has darkened a bit, 
Um, but it also attracts, I mean, any dust just gets stuck to the surface and um, it just kind of keeps, you know, keeps incorporating this grime and it's impossible to get rid of. It also weeps. Um, if you can see at the bottom right underneath it, we have to put a piece of mylar underneath of all of them because they just kind of um, leak that oil all over the place. Um, so first of all, um, physical forces, which is a, a really a common way for um, objects to get damaged, um, especially uh, ut utilitarian objects where people um, tend to handle them as they would in would have been handled in their lifetime. So um, you can see both of these baskets were um, their areas of weakness were where they were handled, right? So along the handles on the side of the, the first basket and then um, the tip of the lid, the little knob at the lid on the second basket. So those are um, definitely handling, um, uh, happen during handling. And this is where most damage occurs is during handling. So um, at MOA, uh, what we do is we have these, um, their storage display handling mounts. We have these um, black tray mounts that we uh, use for um, all of the objects that are appropriate. So it, it doesn't work for things that are too heavy or too large, but for things like baskets, it, it is really ideal. Um, these uh, materials, all the materials used, the, um, it's plastisote, mat boards and metal edge. There's no adhesives, um, which is what you'd want to avoid if you have um, baskets in cases. Um, and it's just a really great way. You can see the object uh, really well. You can uh, move the object, you can turn it around and look at different angles, but you don't ever actually have to handle the object. So um, I really think that um, these, these handling trays have really saved a lot of wear and tear, um, especially like I said, in a museum where we are pulling things um, out of storage, out of exhibit often for um, artists, researchers, and uh, classes to look at. So I did include um, on the handouts our uh, black tray handling mounts. I also wanna say that um, when we were developing these mounts, we did have a lot of community consultation uh, because definitely there are other um, archival foams out there, um, but the plastisote is archival. We did get a lot of uh, feedback from communities um, who didn't really like the clinical look of the white, um, Ethafoam or Tyvek. So um, they much preferred the black. And in our galleries, it does kind of just make the objects um, pop a bit more. Um, and it also just gives that little extra protection against any vibrations since we are in an earthquake zone. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, packing for storage or travel. So um, like I said, our objects do travel, whether they're going into communities or whether they are going on loan to other institutions. And um, I just wanted to show you some of these images um, and it's all archival materials. So we've got um, ethafoam cutouts uh, lined with Tyvek in a coroplast box, uh, stabilized with a bit of twill tape. And uh, here's, a, here's another image. So these just ensure that those objects do not move around uh, in the box while they're in transit. And something like this might also be appropriate um, for storage if you have a particularly uh, vulnerable object. The white ethafoam and the Tyvek uh, really does, um, uh, you can notice if there's any flaking or any insect activity or anything like that, you can notice it right away against the white foam. And we also um, take our black tray, uh, uh, the, the concept and the materials and, and the supports over to some exhibition mounts. So um, here we have this little Northwest Coast hat and uh, the interior support is made of the um, plastisote and mat board, but now it's just secured to a brass mount, which we can um, fit 
it fits into the hardware of our cases and it's just carrying the black tray concept um, into a different mount, but it's still um, stable and uh, keeps the object safe. So um, the next thing I wanted to talk about were pests. And um, when I did approach some um, smaller museums and cultural centers about things that uh, did worry them or their main concerns around their collection, um, pest really um, was a number one concern. So uh, when I say pests, I mean, we can in include molds, fungus, microorganisms, but uh, really it's uh, insects and rodents. So uh, insects will eat some basketry materials, as you can see uh, on the, the slide on the right. Uh, there's a bur burrowing insect that has made holes in this basket but um, they can also be attracted to any um, dirt um, that is on your object, whether it's um, dirt from use or just uh, dusty buildup. Um, and then rodents are always, rodents are always a concern if they are in your building. Um, and if you do have a big rodent problem, um, I think that you do need the, the advice of a, a professional exterminator. But for insect pests, we do have a very rigorous IPM program, which is an integrated pest management program. And uh, it's, it's rigorous. We have, there's three main steps. And the first is anything uh, that comes into the museum is frozen. If it can't be frozen, uh, then we put it in anoxia. And anoxia is just an oxygen deprived environment. Uh, so freezing, we freeze for two weeks at minus 20 degrees Celsius. And for anoxia, um, this is an example of just a small chamber uh, and that, that's, that we built, that we build um, for our objects going through anoxia. It's made of, uh, the silver is Marva seal, uh, which is um, a vapor barrier. And then um, the top clear coat is a scowl, which is like Marva seal. Um, the advantages you can see through it, the disadvantages is a little bit more expensive. So um, there are times when you absolutely want to see what's going on in uh, your anoxia environment. So a scale is a really good um, choice for that. If not, you can make a whole enclosure out of uh, Marva seal. And so um, if you can see right on the right of the screen, there's a little basket um, at the edge. That is, um, that's a new Chalneth uh, woven basket and it's woven around a bottle. So the glass, not so great for um, freezer. That's why it was put in anoxia. So that's the first step of the IPM. The second step is monitoring. So we use sticky traps. Um, we don't use any, um, any poisons or pest controls. We just use sticky traps and it just helps us keep track of what types of insects are entering the building. And we monitor those every week. Uh, we can see patterns at certain times of the year, but it's just, um, it's just kind of the first line of defense. And then housekeeping is also extremely important that um, of course, no food or drink in collections areas, in galleries, in storage areas, even our, in our works spaces adjacent to those areas that we have no food or drink. Um, and just keeping things free of clutter. Uh, so next, uh, let's talk about light damage. So um, for baskets, um, especially those, um, those natural dyes or those aniline dyes, which a lot of um, some of the traditional um, grasses were, were dyed with, um, are extremely sensitive to light. Um, so you can see this is the same basket. Um, the photo on the right is the interior of the lid, which has not been exposed to light. And the photo on the left is the, the part that is facing the light. So um, you can see that light damage is, is definitely um, worse for organic materials and it's, it's cumulative. So it just keeps happening. Um, at the museum, I mean, we have um, in our multiversity galleries, we have 
very, very low light levels. Um, our standard light levels are about 150 lux, but for organic materials, it's 50 lux. So that's all organic. So textiles, paper, basketry, everything. Um, and then we also do a rotation once a year. So for things like textiles or even baskets, uh, you can turn things, right? So they can be on exhibit for a year. In a year, you can turn it. Uh, so the back is facing out, being exposed to the light. And then after two years, it's taken off exhibit. Uh, works on paper a bit different, but that is just one, one way that we stop that cumulative effect of light damage. Plus it allows us to exhibit more of our collection. Now I'd like to talk about pollutants. Um, and uh, so pollutants are things that are in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, we talk about sort of gases that are in the atmosphere or VOCs, uh, that's volatile organic compounds. And a lot of those uh, that we are very um, wary of come from um, things that have been used to build um, casework, or exhibit shell or um, storage shelves. So things like wood will uh, release um, VOCs over time. Things like particle board is, are particularly nasty. There's lots of formaldehydes. So you get uh, this, these gaseous formic, formic acids in the air. But also dust is um, considered a pollutant. I know it's dust is everywhere. Um, it's omnipresent, um, but you really can't consider it innocuous because there's just so many things in dust. It's millions of different particles, pollens and abrasive materials and skin cells, everything. So um, dust should not be considered innocuous. Also a buildup of dust will definitely create uh, micro environments on your object, which can just further uh, make acidic environments and cause deterioration. Now this um, example here, this is um, a hat. There's a, I mean, this is a lot of dust. So this is accumulated dust over a long period of time. And um, definitely it, you know, it's kind of sooty, sooty dust. So it's very, very sticky. And so the, just the, you can tell it's changed the color and the overall look of this hat. And it did require quite a bit of intervention to take it off. Um, but at the same time, that dust layer did it tend to preserve those, those, the colors in the, in the pattern a little bit. So that's one thing. But generally, we try to get rid of dust. And so um, now I have a cautionary tale for you um, concerning pollutants. Um, so the photo on the right, that is our old visible storage gallery, which was built in uh, 1976. Uh, so you can see it does look quite dated and it has that kind of nasty particle board in the back and those sliding glass doors, it's not airtight. So the dust would really, really accumulate in those, in those um, visible storage areas. So then on the left, there's our beautiful um, new multiversity galleries with the cases um, that are airtight and are not letting in any dust. But what we didn't anticipate were um, some reactions that some reactions in the cases. So although those cases are made of inert materials like glass and powder coated steel, there was a particular adhesive um, that was used on the metal to the glass and um, a silicone gasket. And lo and behold, those two things reacted together. And now we have um, the, these crystal deposits that are on our objects. So this is, of course, it's, it's really a terrible situation. And I think what I um, my takeaway from this is, I mean, first of all, this is a, a, the perfect example of pollutants in your cases um, and why they're not good. Um, so air exchange in cases is good. So airtight, if you have, um, airtight cases are not good because you're just trapping um, everything in the case. Even, even um, 
sort of the objects will off gas themselves. So there are VOCs just coming from the objects. So airtight is not necessarily good. Um, having some air exchange is good. Barring that, um, I, I don't know if I would ever recommend having a completely airtight case. So live and learn. Um, but now um, I wanted to show you our storage area and how we are kind of dealing with the pollutants in the area. So this is just uh, an example. Of, this is our basket tree area in the storage area. You can see the black trays. The trays are just a little bit bigger than the objects, so there's no chance of them bumping into each other. Um, so they're, they're safe, they're at a safe distance. Um, if you can see those bars, um, up towards the top of the photo, those are earthquake bars. So we, as I said before, we do live in an earthquake zone. So earthquakes are something that we're always thinking of and it just adds a little bit extra um, stabilization. But um, we do think about dust a lot in our area, in our storage areas. So um, one of the things that we've done is we've made um, these dust covers for our outer facing uh, units. Um, this is just um, pieces of muslin that have been pieced together and um, we have some velcro just along the edges so you can just peel them back and um, access the, the objects as you need. We also, um, for certain items, we have these um, little dust covers that are made of either um, Holytex or Rime um, and they are custom made for each um, each item. Um, and if they are covered up, we usually have a photo with the accession number and uh, just the object. So you, so you know what you're, you don't have to take off the cover if, uh, to find out what it is. And then um, before in the entrance of all our storage areas, we have these sticky mats, um, which just take the dirt off your shoes and you can peel them away once they're, once they're dirty, um, revealing uh, the next sticky mat underneath. Um, so now uh, I'm worried about incorrect humidity and temperature. Often those things go hand in hand. Um, so uh, on the left is an example, and that's an extreme example, um, but that's just a, uh, some remnants. That's not the whole basket. That's just sort of things that have flaked off a very um, dried out basket. You can see the imbrication there and some coiling elements, um, definitely not the whole basket. I just wanted a dramatic photo. Um, so that's if, uh, if things get too dry, that's what you're looking at. And then high humidity and high heat, uh, the worst, worst case scenario is uh, mold growth. So um, this again is a very extreme example, but um, we really want to keep those, uh, the humidity and the temperature as stable as possible. Um, at the museum, we have uh, three levels of monitoring or three different ways that we monitor the temperature and humidity. Because we are a part of a very large university, we have the university plant operations who has building sensors. But we also like to keep an eye on it ourselves. We used to use uh, these hobo data loggers um, up in the, the left hand corner. Uh, but we've recently switched to a local um, product in development. Uh, these, they're called buns. And uh, you can, everything's online, so you can look and you can figure out the, um, the environmental parameters at any time. Um, so you know, you want to stay as even as possible, usually between uh, 45 and 55% relative humidity and between uh, 20 and 21 degrees uh, Celsius. So I think um, the important takeaway is uh, about humidity is fluctuations are really um, detrimental. So you want to avoid fluctuations as much as possible because when you get the fluctuating, that's when you get the expansion and the contraction and that's when the damage starts to occur. So even if your humidity is a little bit on the low side, um, as long, you know, say it's at 40%, as long as it stays at 40% and doesn't do um, fluctuate dramatically um, over, uh, say, a 24 hour period, 
uh, you should be okay. It's really the, the fluctuations that are bad. Uh, so for controlling humidity, uh, we can use things like silica gel. Um, there's also um, the Desi packs or um, Artsorb, which I believe is uh, available from, from Talus. And um, those, if you, have a, if you have something that needs to be really stable, uh, you can use these things to um, keep the, the humidity stable. So here, I just wanted to show you, um, so we use the same uh, little black boxes and we can tuck them into um, uh, either exhibit cases or in our dry cabinets. Um, just to, to maintain the, the relative humidity. So I know uh, when we were talking about our agents of deterioration, uh, we did have fire and water on there. Um, and for us, that's more of uh, those things. If you're dealing with lots of water and lots of, or lots of water, like in a flood situation or a fire, um, it's really, it, it falls into emergency for us. So um, we've always had these uh, big red salvage kits that are on wheels. Uh, we have a couple of them and they are, they were um, specifically made in case there was an earthquake. Um, but then just a couple of years ago, we had um, a flood because a water main broke just um, outside our front door. And we're actually a little bit below street level. So the water came rushing down the stairs through the entrance. And then uh, just at the edge, it just stopped right before it entered the great hall. Um, so we did able, we were able to use a salvage kit, but now we have um, just a kit that's dedicate, dedicated to floods and to seeping up a lot of water very quickly. So um, I think talking about emergency planning and salvage, that's sort of a whole other um, topic, um, but it's, it's something that I believe every museum should, should be planning for. I did want to talk about um, treatments, basket treatment, and how we would treat a basket uh, because um, uh, so you could recognize those baskets if they came into your collection. Um, and just to just to show you how we do um, deal with things like that and why why we do treatments. So generally, a treatment, a conservation treatment is uh, considered an intervention. Um, so it's it's a bit beyond just the preventive stuff. If you have your preventive stuff, it really stops the need for intervention. But if you do say you have a new basket coming into your collection and you find that it is just degrading and its current condition is causing further deterioration, then it is time to maybe look at treating that basket. Um, also, the danger of disassociation, I think, is, is a concern and it is one of uh, the main agents of deterioration. Uh, sometimes bringing two things together in a cohesive way is worth um, the intervention and doing a treatment. And for us, I mean, you know, we will do treatments before uh, something goes on exhibit. And so that's usually a discussion with the curator. And, but we do, we consider all the things before we even, uh, we consider history of use and construction um, and what really is best for the basket. If, if, um, the basket is going to be uh, harmed by any treatment, we wouldn't do it. Um, it really has to be um, stabilized or just contribute to the integrity of the overall piece. So um, cleaning is considered uh, a treatment in some cases. I think dry cleaning or dusting is not, not necessarily a treatment. Uh, it's just good housekeeping and good maintenance. So um, dry cleaning uh, is just, we use a soft uh, natural fiber brush. And here we have a vacuum attachment, just a screen um, over the hose and you just gently, uh, the hose never touches the basket. That's what you're using the brush for just to uh, vacuum any dust or debris into the hose. And then the mesh just stops if, if, you know, by any chance something does come off the basket, it stops it from going into the vacuum. So you can take it off and save, save that piece. Um, 
and then also, so this is this is uh, a spot cleaning treatment that was done, and um, I mean I think every museum has these um, kind of old school accession or catalog numbers applied to them. So you know the whiteout with um, the black marker, um, and uh, so this was reduced. Uh, because we just didn't want that on the surface of the basket anymore. So the way to approach something like this would be to remove it as much as you could gently and mechanically, uh, either with toothpicks or um, something that will chip away at that whiteout. And then uh, maybe using a very damp solvent or a very damp swab uh, with a little bit of uh, either acetone and water or uh, water, but just very damp. And you, you have to make sure that you just stay on that, uh, that accretion that's there because you don't, especially if your basket's dry, you don't want any of that moisture coming in contact with your basket because it will stain. And there uh, at the, the last image is our new accession number, very discreet, very tiny. Uh, we use uh, just acid-free paper um, applied with Lasco. And then uh, just a note about wet cleaning. Uh, so if you have a wet basket, uh, basket from a wet site, it is completely um, feasible to create it or to clean it uh, while it's wet, but you have to use water. What we use is a Cavitron, which is the same thing that the dentist uses on your teeth. And it's just um, ultrasonic vibration. And you have to use it with running water. So um, there should always be water running as you're using your Cavitron. And it does that the Cavitron doesn't touch the surface, but it just kind of uh, shakes that dirt away. Um, and then reshaping. Uh, also, there's, there's a case to be made for reshaping, especially if, an, if a basket is going on exhibit. Um, so, I mean, this is a this is a not a common look, but it does happen to baskets. They just kind of fall in on themselves, or they've been stored really poorly, uh, so they get kind of warped looking. So when we do uh, reshaping, we usually uh, either do them in a humidification chamber, like this small little basket on the left. So uh, what that is is there's uh, Gore-Tex, a sheet of Gore-Tex and then um, some wetted out uh, blotter on top of the Gore-Tex. And then the whole thing is in a polyethylene bag. And it just gives enough moisture to, to uh, make the basket a little bit more malleable. And then um, if you don't wanna put the whole basket into a chamber, uh, you can do spot humidif humidification as well. So there you're just making a sandwich. So you've got uh, the Gore-Tex layer, and then the wetted out blotter on top of that. And then uh, between some mylar. So you're just humidifying that one point. And then once your basket is humidified, uh, you can do a bit of reshaping. Uh, so it definitely it needs some support. So these are two different examples of uh, just support while reshaping uh, the first one on the left is using rare earth magnets and um, just uh, pieces of white mat boards uh, on the inside and the outside. So um, there's the, that's a tiny, tiny basket. So it it's, would not be able to withstand a clamp. And these are just kind of very, very um, small clamps that um, we were able to use on this basket. It's a bit bigger. It just holds the basket and the, and the materials in place so it can dry in the right shape. Oh, and then this is also, uh, this is uh, just a support during, um, or for exhibition or storage, right? So this is just uh, the cut mat boards, um, just a little bit up the size of uh, these, these um, tall cylindrical baskets tend to slump. So um, this is just scored mat boards, um, giving it some support. Uh, again, there's no adhesive. It's just um, the mat board is on the tray with metal edge. Uh, a bit about the materials that we use for uh, repairing baskets. Um, so there's really, uh, there's only a few adhesives 
uh, to consider. Uh, there's the Japanese wheat starch paste. Uh, there's carboxymethylcellulose. There's PVA, which is uh, polyvinyl acetate, which is your white glue. And Jade 403 is one of those archival white glues. And then Lascaux. Really, um, only I would only consider the top two, the wheat starch paste, wheat starch paste and the carboxymethylcellulose. Um, and then really only the wheat starch paste because they're strong enough to uh, make the bond, but they're also completely irreversible in water. Um, and they, um, it's just a really nice material to work with. The, the, the PVA and the Lascaux tend to leave um, your repairs glossy and uh, it doesn't fit well with the basket. Um, for patches and supports, uh, generally we use the Japanese tissue, tinted Japanese tissue um, or embroidery thread. Uh, sometimes imitation sinew if it's more of a connection point or I mean a lot of baskets do have uh, sinew ties uh, so it can be used to um, to reinforce those. So this is a pretty um, old school Japanese tissue repair. Um, so and, I, and I'm you know it's not really a repair that we would do right now but we do have a lot of these in our collection. Uh, so it's just these um, tinted Japanese tissue bandages. Um, and you can see this particular hat had lots of um, losses. Um, so, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't um, hurt it in the long run and it's stable. Uh, so we wouldn't necessarily remove that, but it's just something to recognize. If you see something like that in your collection, it's not doing any damage and it, it's a pretty old school type of repair for basketry. Uh, now we go more for the twisted strands, uh, which is uh, like the tinted Japanese tissue. Uh, usually water cut and then twisted and used as uh, as a support or a band-aid between two pieces that are coming apart. So they're they're hard to see, um, but I hope you can see them uh, there with the red arrows or, or pointing to each one. And then this is a different type of repair and it's not really that common, uh, but it is a good example of how you can use Japanese tissue. Um, so this was an intern project and she basically reconstructed uh, part of the bottom of this basket in the tinted Japanese tissue. And it, you know, it looks good. It's not obtrusive. It doesn't, it's not distracting. Um, um, and it's also because it's, she used wheat starch paste, it's always, it's completely uh, reversible. And this is, I know this slide is kind of hard to see, but I've uh, circled the repairs in red. And this is, uh, uh, this is a really tiny basket and uh, embroidery thread and wheat starch paste were used to um, just bridge that, that tear along the, or just underneath the rim. And so finally, um, there are also, um, traditional repairs. So something that was repaired while the basket is still in use, like this repair here at the bottom of the basket. So this was done uh, either by the maker or by the owner. And definitely it's not something that we would ever remove. Um, it's actually pretty special. So uh, that's something that we would wanna hold on to. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. That's all I have for now. Um, is it, uh, did we have some questions or did we want to? Oh, we have questions. Everyone's been doing great in the Q&A box. So okay. um, that's perfect timing okay. actually for you us to start doing that. Okay. okay. Um, so you're more than welcome to keep sharing your screen or you can turn it off and we can start going through the okay. questions as they appeared. Sure. And thank you for that presentation. That was great. I am. Um, cool. In a prior life, I worked for a tribal museum and we had a lot of baskets. So it's been quite fun to kind of be looking at all the different basket styles and everything else you've been having on there for sure. Oh, oh good, it's good.
Um, so let me start with, I'll just start at the top for now and I'll jump around a little bit with the Q and A box. Just if I see um, questions that are all alike, I will try to get to them, but we'll be doing some jumping around as well. Okay. So um, one of the first questions that got put in was interested in knowing if you asked your family visitors to wash their hands before handling collections. Also, do your staff handle the same objects with gloves? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so in our research room, uh, which is actually I'm speaking to you right now from my research room, and we have a sink. I'm just kind of going to pan over. In that cabinet, we have a sink. And we always give uh, family members we ask them to wash their hands and we ask them to wash their hands when they're finished, just because we do have, um, we do have pesticides in our collection. We have an XRF and we have done those studies and we found them and we're always uh, concerned about transfer. So we do, we do talk about that and encourage them to wash their hands. Yes, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the, oh, do we, yes, we handle with gloves always. Yeah, that was my experience too. Um, when we had travel members come in, we would, and you'd just say, hey, would you mind washing your hands? And most yeah. of them are like, of course, especially right. like nowadays, especially, I think everyone's much more conscious of oh. hand washing, but yeah. you know, that's no big deal. Um, and the question that came in a little later, which actually you and I had talked a little bit offline was someone, let me see if I can find it real quick, but they were basically asking about um, the difference between what a collections manager or a registrar could possibly do and then what a conservator could do kind of and i didn't know if you wanted to talk about that a little bit and just kind of you know what yeah. you're comfortable what 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 should be appropriate basically well i mean all the registrars and collections managers that i've ever met are pretty impressive careful um people um and i think that i mean just the the cleaning that you know any sort of uh vacuuming things like that um dry cleaning is is definitely acceptable um i we have you know when we have students come to us we they go through all parts of our collections area like we're in the same department as collections we are the collections department so we share a lot of the same uh, tasks in terms of mount making or packing, things like that, right? So if you're mount making or packing, you are handling objects. So, um, you know, we all, we're all on the same page. We do have, you know, for new employees, we have like this kind of the MOA training that we do. And part of that is care and handling. Yeah, and just to make sure that I said their question correctly, the original question was, I'm curious as to how much these solutions can be performed by regular collections management staff versus when a conservator should be consulted. And I know for me, because like I said, I'm, I'm a registrar, I'm a collections person, I feel like I can, do, there's certain tasks that like either I've learned or I can read through and be like, okay, if, if something would go horribly wrong, it's not going to hurt the object, right? But if I looking at it and go like, if something could go wrong, I could hurt the object and I'm not comfortable doing this. That's when I kind of stop and go right. consult with one of my conservator colleagues for sure. Yeah, if you can consult and, and that's why I think this form is great, right? Because you can consult um, because I mean, sometimes uh, like, especially with water and baskets, right? water can stain baskets really, really quickly. So I would just be extremely wary of that. And it, it's just a, it's just a little thing, right? It's just, but it's something that as a conservator, I always have at the forefront. So um, I think consulting is good. Um, someone said early on for the black imbrication fibers, are the black fibers usually also cherry bark or are they usually cedar? Uh, I think it can depend. I think you can have uh, black cherry bark, uh, but there's other materials as well. So just uh, because it's black, it doesn't mean that it's not cherry bark. I think that's something that's that's used a lot. I mean, um, willow and other things are used. I think there's kind of a range of things depending on, you know, where it's where you are, what environment you're in. Um, someone asked, can you repeat the materials you use for your handling trays? Was that included in some of the resources you had yes. put together for us? Yes. So um, I did um, give you a link. I think, yeah, I gave you a link to the MOA website. And on the website, we have that the, uh, 
a, a whole um, instruction manual on how to make those black trays. And uh, so it's, it's polyethylene plastisote uh, is the black foam and then the acid-free mat board. So we did, we did test those in-house uh, years ago. Um, so, I, you know, if that was from a certain supplier, so it's just, um, if you can find acid-free mat board, that's good. Um, and the metal edge is uh, also something that's used. I mean, there's also various cutting tools that you, that you require, but um, please have a look through that um, manual. Um, it's out there and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, further down the line. I re put the link to our page in the chat and in the Q and A box, and that leads directly to the handout that Maury put. Okay, in, so you should okay. be able to access it that way as well. Um, there were a couple questions of just like, where do you get your supplies? Like, someone says, "Hello, where can one find the metal edges?" Um, someone else was talking about the sticky mats, which I'll find in here somewhere, and I love the sticky mats because yeah. it shows how gross everyone's shoes are as they yeah. go in. But where do you find? And obviously, you're up in Canada, but what kind of um, people do you go to when it comes to supplies? So for this, the sticky mats, we get them at Fisher Scientific. So I, I think that's a North American company as far, yeah, it's not just Canada. So Fisher Scientific has those. There's another very large company that has them um, and which are pretty easy to find, um, but they're out there. Um, uh, they're, I think they're made for labs, so any lab supply um, place would have it. And the metal edge, uh, we do get that from a um, local company, and it is in our in that uh, in the black tray manual. There's a whole list of supplies and where we get those supplies, um, and that's sort of local to Vancouver. So I'm not sure. Oh, Hollinger, I think we got it from maybe Hollinger. Uh, someone just said in the chat too that sticky mats come from the computer clean room industry, so they're a lot easier oh, to find. Yeah. And also, someone worked with a sports supplier. They're common for basketball courts as well. So yeah. but that's one thing I love about museum stuff. Is sometimes we just find stuff in weird spots, and we're like, "That'll work." <laughs> like, well, so applications, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, there were also a lot of questions just related to IPM, which um, I know C2C Care has done a whole webinar on IPM. There's lots of resources out there for IBM, IPM, yep. but um, they, they asked, can you say more about when you would freeze and when would you, you would use anoxia treatment? Oh, okay, right, sorry. Um, so also I did, I think I did uh, give you some handouts on the anoxia and the freezing. So anoxia is appropriate when, you're worried about the materials. So there's certain materials that you don't necessarily want to put in the freezer. So glass, you don't really want to put through the freezer. Uh, ceramics, you don't want to really put through the freezer. They're inorganic anyway, so they wouldn't benefit uh, from being frozen. Um, but shells, um, some things like that, some really layered things. Uh, bone, we don't like to put through the freezer. Uh, so those, those materials are better for anoxia. The example that I used uh, in, the, um, in the slides, uh, that was a bottle, a basketry covered bottle. So that's why uh, we chose to put it in anoxia rather than the freezer. We didn't want to put the glass through the freezer. Is it, I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, there's the handout too. If, uh, it, lists all the things to paintings you you wouldn't want to put a painting through the freezer or something heavily painted right right um someone did ask for the anoxia treatment do you only rely on oxygen scavengers to reduce the level of oxygen in the enclosure or is flushing with nitrogen or carbon dioxide used in addition well i i know that some people do that uh so at moa we don't do that we we rely on the oxygen scavengers i'm not saying i'm opposed to that i i'd be interested in doing that but it's just it's, it's not our common practice. I'm reading really quickly through. These are some really good questions. So I'm kind of going through them as quickly as I can. Um, there was some talk about just like supply kits for emergency right. information and kind of where do you, like what do you have in them, which is, to be honest, C2C Care, we're talking about setting up a webinar pretty soon about emergency supply kits and stuff. But do you have any advice for our listeners today? Um, I do. Uh, so 
There's a, a fairly new group that's been uh, started in British Columbia. It's called uh, the BC HERN, and that stands for British Columbia Heritage Emergency Response Network. There's a website and it also has lots of links to uh, how to build an emergency kit, what kind of supplies you want. So I think when you're putting together an emergency kit, uh, you know, you, you want to think like, so, okay, I showed you now that we have the flood kit. So the flood kit is really to just stop water, right? So have some absorbent, super absorbent materials. And then our salvage kits are more for collection salvage. So things like, um, alpha knives and tarps and, uh, you know, string and, uh, clothespins, right? So if you wanted to, say you had a bunch of works on paper and you wanted to hang them up to dry, just everything that uh, you might need to do salvage. So, um, you know, there are some more resources out there. I'd be happy to answer or, or send along some more materials, but I do suggest to check out that BC Hearn website. And Robin, do you want me to send you a link to that or? Yeah. Um, Okay. Please, and we'll update on the, that on the website as well, just as okay. more references. And we can probably even add that to the um, C2C, C2C Care website resources list, which is a whole other kind of little section. I'd be happy to do that. Um, someone was asking just <laughs> kind of like, how do you clean a very dusty, dirty basket? Like if you just came across one, what would be like your first steps when dealing with that kind of a thing? Well, um, I guess the first thing that I would do would be use the soft brush and uh, the mesh covered nozzle just to take off all that surface dirt, right? Um, and try to get as much off as you can. I think uh, the next step, I might try um, some uh, either cosmetic sponges. I mean, not wet, just the, just the sponges to see if you can get off any more ingrained dirt or there's the groom stick. Do you, you have groom stick, right? Yeah, a groom stick. So it's just... Uh, a natural rubbery thing that you you don't um, rub it on the object you just kind of go pass over the object to get any more ingrained dirt it's kind of a process right you start with the least interventive and then you um, carry on from there there were also people asking about suppliers for the uh, sinew and Gore-Tex the imitation sinew Oh, you know, off the top of your head. They're also located in Israel, which might add a oh. complication. Oh, too. so I guess may, they might not have Michaels in Israel. I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> so crafts, you know, the sinew is craft supply stop, shops, but you can, you can make your own, right, you, with uh, colored wax. And, you know, you could add uh, pigment to any, any wax and then coat, um, a piece of fabric or some threads. Um, so yeah, I know that we get ours from uh, like just art supply, craft supply places. We had two questions released relating to the, and I'm gonna not do good at naming this, the plastizote. <laughs> Basically yes. they're saying, what is it like chemical type of plastic? Where can I buy it? And then someone is also asking about the density and how are you adhering the pieces? Okay, so uh, the plastizote, uh, it's polyethylene plastizote. So it's cross-linked, so it doesn't, um, it doesn't off-gas. Um, there is different densities of it. Um, and there's, the higher density is definitely easier to cut. I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head, the density, but it is in the supply list on the, um, on the handout. Um, so we get it up from a place called Norseman All Foam, and that is located on the lower mainland in British Columbia. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm certain that you can get that foam through other suppliers. Like the yeah, it's polyethylene plastizote um, or plastizote. It comes in gray and black, um, and it does actually it comes in white as well. Um, but the we've chosen uh, the density in the handout because it's easy because of its it's easy to work with. Um, and there was one more part of that question that 
that I can jump back and look. Um, while I'm looking for that though, someone did ask why you guys chose the black foam as compared oh. to the white foam. I, sorry, okay, I'll answer that. I just remember the other uh, part of that question was if we use adhesive or what kind of adhesive. And I think the, the reason why we do those black trays and why they're made the way they are is so we don't have to use adhesive. We really, really wanted to avoid that because as you know, there's lots of um, things in adhesive that off gas and you don't want that um, off gassing in your, in your um, exhibit spaces. So we use metal edge. So it's just basically scoring the bottom of, of your plastisote and hammering out your metal edge, and then you hammer the metal edge to uh, your mat board. It works really, really well. It's very secure. And then the other question was- uh, Why you guys chose black foam for oh, the artifact storage rather than white? Right. So um, when we were in the planning process of uh, the multiversity galleries, it was part of a larger project called uh, the Partnership with the Peoples. And so we had a lot of community consultation. Uh, we brought uh, community members in and we had, a, we had all sorts of different variations of, of different mounts in different materials. You know, do you like this? We had, we had just the plain white ethophone, uh, which was deemed to be too clinical looking, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I totally agree. Uh, we had lots of advice on, um, uh, like sort of model pole mounts and where they were fastened to their um, secure or to their to their mount, right? So you avoid things um, being secured around the neck. Um, you want things secured at the base. Uh, so the color really was um, it, it was a material that we were working with, and it was there was a preference for the black. Kind of connected along with that, um, someone asked, do you conduct consultations with tribal members before performing some or all treatments? Or kind of what's that process when you talk yeah, to if them? we can, always, mm -hmm. always, definitely, uh, we do consult. Um, so, yeah, especially, you know, if we know that we can find uh, family members, current family members or um, community members, we will, we will consult. Um, Either you know, either directly, or we'll go through a curator that maybe has a relationship uh, already established. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important, especially when you're dealing with those types of objects, is to talk. Especially because a lot of those, at least my experience was, since they um, had the knowledge to actually build the baskets from ground up, like yeah. just learning that process and understanding it helps when you come up with your storage plans and all that other kind yeah. of stuff. It, it gives you some insider knowledge on how that will work. So. Plus, most of those people love to teach. And it's fun to learn from them. <laughs> so that's the way I always oh, we learn. It. Yeah, we can learn so much. Mm -hmm. um, this is interesting. Can you please define disassociation? So how would you define that? So um, I guess it's, it's something with uh, an uh, object with a clear break, or that's in several pieces, right? Um, I think if something is in several pieces, you know, not connected at all, there is a danger of losing part of that object. There's also, um, you know, a danger of it getting disassociated from its information record or its catalog record, right? So, you know, losing a catalog number, you're not, I mean, if you, I mean, we have um, probably over 50,000 objects. If we lose a catalog number, it is, it is um, pretty serious and we, we don't have that information. Um, so we need the provenance and, uh, and also we just don't want to lose pieces of the object. So um, whether it's put in an enclosure or a stable mount, keeping everything together. Yeah, that's always one of the prime things is trying to keep all that information together yeah. until, you know, it can either get stored properly or scanned or maybe a digitized version if it's paperwork that comes along with it, any of that kind of stuff. Um, someone did ask a question about just kind of your budget for collection management materials. They, they, they said you did not have to talk about like exact amount, but just what percentage of it is it for your overall budget um, when you're doing your planning? Uh, well, in 2021 or like in 2018, <laughs> well, I think um, 
we initially had a very uh, large budget to get because we had a, we had several grants uh, from the uh, Canadian Foundation of Innovation, uh, sort of like a million dollar grant, millions of dollars of grants to make all of those black trays, right? To hire all those people because it is very labor intensive, um, and uh, I can't tell you, I can't give you an exact dollar amount, but uh, I can say that we are supported by the university. Um, and uh, because we are a teaching institution and we do want to, um, you know, really show best practices. Um, you know, we do have, there is always the budget for materials and, um, archival materials and um, if we can't if we have if we we won't envision a project and cut corners uh, either we'll um, use the right materials um, with the right um, staffing or we won't do it yeah I think that's oh go ahead so I felt like a politician there when I answered that <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. I mean, because, you know, I know, like, when I worked full time at museums, sometimes we would be like, okay, we're going to tackle that big project that deals with storage, and then your budget would explode for a year, yeah. and you'd be trying to figure out, you know, all the fun stuff. And then other years, you'd be like, okay, we're going to be working on a digitization project, so then you're not as much money on storage materials, so it just kind of depends. Yeah. Um, someone asked generically if you'd be willing to share your emergency plan and your IPM plans. <laughs> so I don't know if we could contact you offline for that one. Yeah. So I did share, uh, there was a couple of IPM documents that I um, did pass along the, those Word documents. One's on freezing and one is on um, anoxia. But yes, I would be, I would be happy to share um, or share information or answer any questions that you have. Um, I might get start doing some rapid fire questions to you. So be prepared. Sure. And if you don't know, it's fine. But like I said, okay. there's still quite a few questions. So I'll get right. through as many as I can. Okay. Um, someone says freezing cycle, two weeks completely in freezer or is there a period of resting at room temperature in between? Yes, so um, two weeks, that's our protocol. And then a day rest before we even, like we take it out of the freezer, it sits for a day and or 24 hours. And then we do the unwrapping. And I always, it's always important to have tissue around your, your object. We wrap everything, right? So we wrap it in tissue and then we wrap it in polyethylene and seal it. Uh, when dry cleaning, is there any detriment to the object if one uses a synthetic fiber brush over a natural fiber brush? Uh, no, I don't think so. As long as it's soft and not, you know, some of those bristles can be quite, um, rigid. I think it's more about being soft. Uh, can you provide, well, this is a reference for a published vocabulary dictionary for describing parts of a basket. Is there a guide that you would recommend or mm -hmm. any other kind of publication? Well, there is in, a, uh, I think in the bibliography, there's um, that one resource, um, antique uh, Amer Native American baskets, something like that. They have a really, really good comprehensive um, uh, descriptions. They go through it um, and talk about all the different parts. So um, I would, yeah, look in the, in the bibliography. It should be there. Perfect. Um, how often do you perform preventative treatments like dusting and cleaning? Well, uh, so often when uh, things are first accessioned. So we definitely, uh, or when, they, when they're first acquired, so when they come into the museum, that's when they get the most hands-on processing, right? So cleaning uh, and the freezing and the mounting, all that stuff. And then, I mean, our storage areas are pretty good. Um, they're, so they should go in there clean um, and uh, they, they should, um, you know, if something if something comes across and it is obviously uh, dirty, we, we will um, we will do that work. But it's we don't really have anything on a rotation schedule um, because we things are pretty dust free in storage areas. In the cases, I mean, we have that crystal problem, so that is a 
that is something that we are going to be addressing full on soon. Um, someone was asking, they, they really like seeing all the materials that you're using. So there's a lot of questions about that, but they were asking about the dust covers. Do you guys use Tyvek for the dust covers or what do you uh, use? Well, you could use Tyvek, but most of them are Holytex or Rime. So we call, I think you could, do you have Rime in the States? It's also called uh, Pemlin. Think. Oh, I think I've heard of that. Yeah, for sure. it's just yeah. like it's like a it's a polyester pressed polyester. Okay. Um, have you considered using Velux blanket fabric rather than bug screen for covering the vacuum nozzle and dry cleaning? Yes, we have some. Uh, what was the name of the adhesive to attach paper labels? Uh, that's Lascaux. So we use. Uh, two different uh, versions of Lascaux. So there's usually one coat of the Lascaux 303, um, and then we add the paper label, and then there's a, a coating of the Lascaux 498. Okay. Um, it says, I missed what material, oh wait, did we just say that one? I missed what material used to affix the paper numbers to the baskets. Can you repeat it in the Q&A? Just answered that one. Sorry, y'all. I'm also repasting the survey link and the handouts and presentations link in the chat, which is why I was doing, I was multitasking there for a second. Um, can you discuss a little bit about how to clean mold from baskets? Yeah, uh, so definitely if you are dealing with something like that, uh, you really need to protect yourself. Um, so either with a respirator or if you have access to a fume hood, I think that's really, really important. Um, so I would go through the same process as, as I would um, do with, with um, just sort of a dusting, right? Have um, a soft brush, have your, um, your covered uh, vacuum nozzle, um, but then once you're finished with that task, then throw those things away or just keep them uh, contained and just use them for dealing with moldy baskets. Um, yeah, mold is, is, is not a fun thing to deal with and uh, you really have to be really, really careful. Yeah, I live in Florida, so we're, we experience mold. Yeah. way too much in my day-to-day -day. within my house sometimes <laughs> it's just like oh that's fun <laughs> um this is an interesting question so you you were talking about the starch paste earlier do you need to be concerned about it being um an attractive for pests when you're using that kind of material uh well i guess uh it it is edible um but we are using it in very small quantities and we have that a really rigorous IPM program mm -hmm. so it's not the first thing that uh, comes to mind uh, so and usually we just uh, mix it straight with water um, or distilled water but um, I have heard and maybe you should talk to a paper conservator about that but sometimes they make it with a tiny bit of ethanol which I think is more of a deterrent, but I can't really speak to that. We use water, uh, and uh, we are we are use it in such minute qualities, and we have that IPM program. So, um, so I'm not overly concerned about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to grab two more. Um, so this is: Are there any cons to storing baskets in archival boxes? How would you prefer? Would you rather them have in supports or in, within a box itself? I think boxes are fine. I mean, it's they're protect, protective, and I mean it's useful because if they're in a box, you could feasibly stack them, right? And so you might be able to maximize your storage space. Um, yeah, I think I think boxes are fine. I would. If I was, if I were uh, storing things in boxes, I'd always like to have a picture of uh, the object or either a clear window so you could see what was inside the box. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm a big proponent of if you have a large bulky items within boxes, like if they're safer within the box, that's great. But having that little picture on the outside, yeah. oh, so much, yeah. so nice. It doesn't have to be huge, just a little picture. Yeah, it yeah just helps. It a million times. Um, and after this last question, I think this is interesting. So are you setting up any new policies for new ethnographic baskets 
made of plastics and other materials. So have you seen anything come into your collection that's maybe made in the traditional manner, but different materials? And are you guys kind of preparing to store those things? You know, we haven't, uh, we haven't really seen any baskets per se. Um, but I mean, and we don't have a huge amount of plastics in our collection. We have some, but not a lot, but it's definitely, I mean, we're, we, we don't have a plan in place, but uh, definitely if, if we start seeing a lot of those things coming in, um, we'll definitely take the precautions to make sure that they're, that they're okay. Like, yeah. I mean, we don't have a lot of cellulose nitrate or, or anything like that in our collection. Yeah, I think that's that to me is most the, one of the most fun things of working with um, tribal collections, though, is that you'll see things made from newer materials that it's really cool to kind of see how the artwork has evolved. Yeah, and just the variations. That's a that's a super fun thing about working in those collections for sure. Well, it is 2.30 and there are still like 19 questions <laughs> in the queue. So I want to apologize to everyone. I, I would like to keep going, but at the same time, I, I'm mindful of people's time and what they can do. So um, I will see if I can try to capture these somehow and maybe get them to Maury so you can take a look at them. Sure. Um, just so everyone knows, I did put the links again for the survey for this webinar and also for the handout and presentations on the um, page. Uh, someone also mentioned that one of the links within the handout was acting a little wonky. So I'll take a look at that and make sure oh. things. That might be me when I was converting things. So I will double check and make okay. sure. Um, we will probably try to get this webinar up by the end of the week. Um, so I will be sure to do that. Maury, do you have any other last minute things you'd like to say to the crowd? Uh, no, just thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. It's really fun. We really appreciate you taking some time today. And I want to do a huge shout out and thanks to IMLS, to Maury, of course, to Mike, our producer over at Learning Times. And stay tuned to all of our social media and everything else um, to get an idea of upcoming programming that we're doing for C2C Care. So thanks all, be safe, and we will see you next month. Bye.